Welcome everyone to this presentation by Dr. Malki Spodek. I'll begin with a short introduction. Many of us like to talk about Israel's cherry tomatoes as a symbol of Israeli research prowess and the resulting success at growing produce in the desert. I would guess that most of us have little information on how that's actually done and the challenges that arise from such a seemingly miraculous endeavor. Our guest today is Dr. Malki Spodek. A first-generation Canadian, Dr. Spodek was born and raised in Toronto and is a graduate of York University's Environmental Studies program. In Israel, she completed Masters of Science and PhD degrees in agroecology and plant health with the Department of Entomology at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. She is one of a handful of experts in the world, specializing in a group of insects that are forest and agricultural pests. Dr. Spodek discovered and described several insect species new to science and uses her expertise to inform biosecurity regulations on Israel's imported agriculture. She has published over 20 journal articles and has lectured at various international conferences. She also developed and taught courses in agricultural entomology to university students from Kenya, Cambodia, and Vietnam at the Arava International Center for Agricultural Training. For the past five years, Dr. Spodek worked as a research entomologist in a remote southern Arava desert agricultural research and development station. Her projects focused on developing sustainable practices to manage agricultural insect pests and weeds. Part of JNF Canada's mandate is to support agricultural research in Israel. As such, Dr. Spodek's research was partly funded by our friends at Karen Kayemet Le Israel. Please welcome Dr. Malki Spodek. Okay, it's all right. Maybe we can do it afterwards. Um, well, anyways, good afternoon. Good evening to those in Israel and good morning to those um, in Hawaii and potentially New Zealand. We'll see who, I still see you, Elliot, in, the, in my screen here as speaker. Could everybody hear me okay? Yeah? Yes? Okay, great. Uh, so thanks for the, again for that great introduction and uh, for organizing this webinar. So I will get right to it. Insects. Um, there are about 10 quintil quintillion of insects on planet Earth. That's 10 followed by 18 zeros. They are the most diverse group of organisms and represent 80% of the world's species. So they come in all different shapes, colors, and sizes. But as scientists, we'd like to make order and we've grouped them according to shared common traits. There are 30 such groups and they are actually called orders. And I have spent uh, this last decade studying this small group called Hemiptera. Hemipterans are grouped together because their mouth parts are adapted for sucking, mainly plant fluids. Aphids uh, seen here are, are commonly known to home gardeners and bed bugs that feed on human blood also belong to this group. I specialize in these two, uh, these two group of insects called scale insects and psyllids. So scale insects are notorious agricultural pests. They damage plants by feeding, depleting sap, weakening them, and reducing its quality, leading to unmarketable fruits and vegetables. And, and if anybody's never seen a scale insect before, these black dots on an orange are, each one is an individual uh, scale insect. Um, and this is what it looks like. This is what one looks like. Um, so they don't really even look like traditional looking insects, but nonetheless, they are classified as insects and are very, uh, can be very injurious to plants and, and to farmers. So psyllids, uh, psyllids, that's with a P and you don't pronounce the P, are vectors to plant diseases. And some of them are vectors of plant diseases that are transferred during feeding. So the citrus psyllid seen here has destroyed thousands of citrus orchards around the world. It's not present in Israel, but it has the potential to, to threaten the citrus industry. And therefore there's an ongoing monitoring program for it. But with all the bad rap that insects get with their destructive nature, they can also be useful to us. There are scale insects that live and feed on pine and beech trees seen here. 
uh, that excretes a sugary substance that is, I don't know if you can see that here on the pine tree, um, that's the source of edible honey. Wax, shellac, and dyes are also scale insect byproducts. And, okay. However, when this insect arrived in Israel a couple of years ago, it made headlines threatening the Sabra cactus plant. So known as the cochineal scale native to Mexico, its bright red dye is used to color fabrics and it is a natural source of food coloring. And here you can see, this is actually the headlines in Israel, Eretz Police Sabar, that's like the country without the Sabar. And as everybody knows, the Sabra cactus plant is, is actually one of the symbols for Israelis being all prickly on the outside and soft on the inside. So that's one of the reasons why this, uh, this insect made such the headlines. Um, and here you can see some of the cactus plants being destroyed by this, by this insect. So actually JNF started this research program with, uh, to control the scale insect, teaming up with scientists from Mexico uh, to bring in and introduce natural enemy to control this, uh, this scale insect that is threatening the national plants of Israel. Scale insects are also found on forest trees. And my passion for these insects took root during my PhD study involving a group of insects that live and feed only on oak trees. Oaks are a natural part of the Mediterranean landscape, but looking for insects that are three millimeters in size, which are fully grown, is like looking for a needle in a haystack. But I was up for the challenge and it was a rewarding experience to follow the lives of these curiously looking insects that are fortunately not pests of Israel's forests. So this pea-shaped, insect that doesn't even look like an insect has a re remarkable story dating back to biblical times. It is the source of red dye in the Torah that was used to color priestly garments and the curtains of the tabernacle. It's called Tolat Shani in Hebrew and translated as a scarlet worm. So this poster that you see here was made by the Biblical Museum of Natural History, where specimens that I collected are on display. I recommend a visit to the museum. It's pretty great. Part of my PhD field work included frequent visits to Mount Hermon on the Golan Heights, where one oak species grows that is not found anywhere else in Israel. So it was there that I found a new scale insect to science that I described and published. I named it after its type locality, the place where it lives, Hermonensis. And this is what it looks like. This is the adult female. This is a female and all these red dots are eggs that she's produced. And this is the male that doesn't look anything like the female, but serves his, serves his um, does what he needs to do. Um, is very short lived, doesn't feed, um, pretty remarkable insect. Uh, since I found it on the Hermon, it was also found in Turkey. So there's only two places now uh, where, where this insect is known in the world. So scientists estimate that there are perhaps 30 million insects that are not yet described. As the species become threatened and go extinct in global climate change, there's a growing value placed on biodiversity. Insects that I found and described and many others in different groups are preserved here the insect collections at the Steinhardt Museum of Natural History at Tel Aviv University. These collections are important for natural history research in Israel and the region. And they also serve as a library for biosecurity policies connected to imported agriculture. Over the years, Israel's imports are more than its exports. And as such, and as such there is an increased risk of invasive organisms hitchhiking into Israel on this produce and plant material. Invasive species are the second biggest threat to global ecosystems. They can spread at the, at the expense of indigenous species, disrupting ecological and environmental processes with significant economic impacts. So partnering with the plant protection and inspection services and, it, and adhering to the International Plant Protection Convention Israel's Ministry of Agriculture is required to identify risks on imports. 
myself and other experts consult within the pest risk analysis framework in an attempt to prevent or minimize uh, invasive organisms from entering Israel. Huh. So in addition to being a national expert of my group of insects, I've spent the past five years working as a research entomologist at one of the country's eight regional agricultural R&D stations. These stations are largely supported by CACAL, JNF, the Ministry of Agriculture, ICA Israel, and the regional councils. They were established in order to promote agricultural development through applied research in peripheral communities around the country. Collaborations are with scientists from Israel's academic institutions and different research areas of these stations include soil and water, new crops, field crops, post-harvest, um, and in the remaining time, I will share with you my research in plant protection that took place at the South Arava R&D near Eilat. So the desert region of the Arava Valley that is located between the Dead Sea and the Red Sea in Eilat is characterized by high temperatures and less than two inches of annual rainfall. It is a region that produces about 60% of the total Israeli export for, fruit, for fresh vegetables and about 15% of the ornamental plants, with, be with bell sweet peppers being the leading crop. 60,000 tons of these peppers were produced in 2021 and largely exported to Russia, North America, and the UK. So one of the insect pests of peppers is the cotton mealy bug. Yes, cotton is one of the pests, one of the, one of the plants that it infests, but it also infests over 200 other plants, including tomatoes and eggplants, um, and ornamental plants such as hibiscus and lantana. But in the Arava, it's a major pest of the peppers. It's invasive to Israel, and it arrived, sorry, it originated uh, in Central and South America, and this is some of the damage that it does to the pepper plants. Uh, the numbers build up in large sizes. It becomes a big mess and a big problem for farmers, mainly because it produces, uh, it leads to deformed peppers that are unmarketable. So currently these insects are treated with chemical pesticides and there's no solution for uh, organic growers of the South. The impacts that pesticides have are many, affecting human health and wildlife and impacting water, soil, and air. Israel has an objective to meet obligations of minimal pesticide residues under international agreements for exports. There's also a growing shift of consumer demand for quality chemical-free food and organic agriculture relies on biological pest control. So in organic agriculture, and integrated pest management programs. Natural enemies, including predatory beetles, seen here, uh, and spiders, parasitoid wasps and fleas, pathogens such as bacteria, fungus, and viruses are used to control insect pests. And in Israel, two main companies that sell these beneficial insects to farmers are BOB and BioBest. And here are some of their insect products that they sell to farmers. However, the cotton mealybug infesting pepper plants is an invasive and there is no commercially available natural enemy product to control it. And here comes my research. And so my partners and I set out to search for natural enemies of the mealybug in Israel that could be used as a bile control agent for pest control. And this is what we found. 14 insect species, including a predatory beetle, parasitic wasps, and native lacewing among them. So this is, this is the list of all the insects that we found. And the next step after we identified the most common natural enemies, we wanted to exper experiment with these two insects for their commercial potential. It's important to note that both insects were found, actually all insects were found in Israel and were not imported. So our first trial involved uh, a native predatory beetle seen here. Uh, and this is the larva of the beetle. 
And as you can see, the larva of the beetle looks very similar to the mealybug pest. So in the results showed very, showed very promising results uh, for feeding on this mealybug, predatory beetle feeding on the mealybug. However, we thought that this tiny parasitoid wasp that's um, about two millimeters in size had more potential. So the definition of a parasitoid uh, is that it's an organism that lives in or on an organism. And here you can see a parasitoid wasp at work. Uh, she will lay her egg inside the aphid that here is green and the developing wasp will kill the aphid uh, in, develop inside the aphid and then emerge in emerge as an adult from the aphid's dead body cavity. So this is a healthy mealybug. It's white here and it's parasitized by this wasp. The wasp's wasp has laid its egg in the mealybug and the mealybug has turned brown and then black. And these images that, that I took will show this white bit here is actually a uh, a, a baby parasitoid wasp uh, that's white and that's developing inside the body cavity of the dead mealybug that I've opened for the picture. So in my remote desert lab at the South Arva R&D, that's my, that's my old office, I established rearings for both the wasp and the mealybug with the objective to study the life cycles of both of them and to optimize rearing conditions. Now, this is a bunch of potatoes that we've tried different varieties of, um, and this is what we use to feed the, the mealybugs. Actually, we sprout the potatoes and on the sprouts, uh, the mealybugs will develop. Um, and here are just lo loads of cages, um, both insects. I then conducted dead house experiments to quantify the efficacy of the parasitoid wasp on different mealybug populations under net house conditions. These experiments showed promising results and the next stage was to establish a mass rearing to conduct field trials in real time. So partnering with BioBest, thousands of wasps and I don't know if you can see in these vials, these little black dots are the wasps um, and mealybugs reared in my lab were shipped to their industrial size facility on Kibbutz Yad Mordechai with the aim of establishing a mass rearing for future experiments with pepper growers and potentially commercializing the wasp as a biological control agent. Um, and this is actually the van that BOB Bio, sorry, BioBest would come down to the Arava every two weeks to pick up a package of, of these insects to, uh, to bring back to their facility. So peppers are the main crop in North and Central Arava, but anyone who has driven to Eilat will notice the date palms that dominate the desert landscape on the side of the Arava highway. And date production drives the agriculture agricultural economy of the South Arava. And this innocent looking plant is the subject of my second research subject project. It's the subject of my second research project. It's called the swallow ward or strangle vine. Um, and unlike the cotton mealybug that is invasive to Israel, this weed is a common plant along river systems. However, it was brought to the larva as an ornamental plant to attract a beautiful species of butterfly, and it has now spread to irrigated date orchards, growing freely, engulfing young trees like this one, inhibiting tree development, limiting access for harvesting, and reducing yields. And here are some more pictures of a strangle vine um, and a young date tree being strangled by this, by this vine. So weed management includes weed, man weed management options include camel donkeys that feed that graze freely on in the plantations. However, this plant is actually phytotoxic, and these animals won't, won't go near them. They won't feed on them. Mechanical weeding seen here is time consuming. Um, and herbicide treatment has limited application times based on harvest schedules. Um, and these chemicals can't be used in the organic plantations. 
And so partnering with weed scientists and an agroecologist, uh, we set out to develop a management protocol integrating biological, ecological, physical, and chemical aspects into managing the weed, an integrated weed management approach, if you will. The biological ecological part consisted of monthly insect surveys to various state orchards in order to observe, collect, and identify feeding on the weed, insects that feed on the weed. The idea behind this survey is to understand how and if we can use the naturally occurring feeding insects to our benefit for weed management. And I just like to give a shout out here to, uh, to Mason Russo, who is joining us, and he is a PhD candidate at the University of Hawaii. And this is him in these images. He came down and, uh, and worked on this project with, with us. These are some pictures of a variety of insects feeding on different plant parts. So up here in the upper right, you can see uh, a moth caterpillar feeding on a seed pod and below it, uh, a ca butterfly caterpillar munching on a leaf of the vine. And these yellow dots here are a group of aphids sucking on flower stems, a flower stem of the plant. So this is a summary of 12 of the insects species from three different orders that feed on the plant parts. And by combining that information with the weed development throughout the year, including when the plant will flower, uh, when, there's, when it produces seed pods and when the seed pods are open, we can understand the agroecological system a little better. But more research is needed to quantify the feeding habits of these insects. But the data collected thus far is the foundation for future conservation biological control management of the weed. So basically, what I've tried to share with you in the, in the past, in the, in the time that we've had here, is this just take home message that not all insects are bad, annoying, and harmful. Insects can also be a source of, of great byproducts, such as natural dye, shellac, and food. They, um, they are a natural part of the ecosystem and can be beneficial in agriculture and forestry uh, in biocontrol programs. Uh, they have an unlimited potential as we discover new species to science and explore new ways to use them. I'd like to thank the funders of my research projects, including JNF, Kakal, my research partners, uh, and all of you for your attention this afternoon. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Spodek, Malki. Uh, fascinating. Uh, if people do have questions, uh, I think we have a small enough group that we can allow people to just to put up your virtual hand or your regular hand. Uh, and that way we can uh, see who has a question. Let me uh, just, uh, I'm gonna switch to gallery view here. Uh, so if, does anybody have a question right off the bat? And those who don't have their camera on, you have to use your virtual hand or turn on your camera. Isaac, Paul, go ahead. Okay, that was fascinating. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to ask you, it, it must've been very exciting for you to discover a new species and then end up uh, naming it. So what's the procedure for uh, submitting uh, your discovery and ultimately choosing the name? Right. Well, it's quite a lengthy process. Good question. It's quite a lengthy process for describing a new, a new anything to science. Um, but there are rules and regulations, um, the zoological code, um, that exists. Um, and it was actually because it was part of my training when I was doing my PhD on how to learn how to do this. And, um, and I had great mentors who helped me through the process. But the biggest thing that one needs to do is to make sure that nobody else found it before you. <laughs> so that's searching through the literature, um, going to museums. I had the privilege of going to two museums in Europe, in London and, and in Paris. Where, um, where these insects are, are kept and preserved. Um, actually naming an insect also has a whole code around it, but being the author of the insect that I've described, I did have um, a little bit of free, uh, a law actually a, a, large, uh, a large 
I was able to name it. I mean, I was able to decide what, what it is, but it needs to be within the framework of the code of zoological um, conduct. And yeah, it was really exciting. And, and, and since then I have found several others that I have described and, and have published and um, in, a different, in a different group. And, um, and there actually are more that I have found that, that have not yet been described by me. So I'm waiting for some time to do that. Is there but, a and specifically in the Arava, the Arava is a very, very special uh, ecosystem in, you know, new species of, of all organisms are being found all the time there. Um, it's a very, very uh, unique environment. Is there a central organization or committee that oversees the process? Well, well, sure. You'll, you'll, you'll publish when you, when you uh, submit your paper for publication. Um, it gets peer reviewed uh, by by experts in in the area, and that's the, those are, that's the, those are the guidelines that you follow. But but describing an insect is very tedious. I mean, it involves very many measurements <laughs> of <the> microscopic <laughs> insect parts, <laughs> and not just one. <laughs> You'll have to do it uh, ten to 12, 20 times for replications. Um, so many, many hours uh, in front of a microscope. Um, and I can send you the publication if you're interested to see um, how it's done, how it was done. Thank you. Right. Uh, other questions? I have one. Um, I'm wondering, with the use of beneficial insects, for example, the strangle weed on the date palms that you showed, if you have success and they destroy the weed, what then? Do they die off because there's nothing to eat? Uh, or do they become a problem in and of themselves because uh, you've introduced something that wasn't there before? It's a really good question. And that's often the concern with these biological control programs. Fortunately, the surveys that we've done um, include insects that are, are local. They already live there. We're not introducing something new from a different country, from a different part of the, uh, of the country found locally. And so what they, these insects have done is they've taken, um, they haven't co-evolved and they haven't adapted to the new, to the weed that's been introduced to the area, but it's just another food source for them. So once the weed has been eliminated, they'll continue eating what they were eating before. And, and it's important, and it's important to note that those insects are not pests within themselves. I mean, butterflies and moths and Yes, they're not insects within, the, they're not pests within themselves. Thank Good you. question. Yeah, thanks. Uh, other, other comments or questions? Anyone? Isaac? How do you, <clears throat> excuse me, how do you uh, narrow down the list of potential beneficial insects that you, you try to uh, uh, utilize? Another, another time to go into the literature review. Um, fortunately for the cotton mealybug, or unfortunately, the co it's named as a cotton mealybug because it's a pest in parts of the world, mainly India, where it's a pest of cotton. And, uh, and although they have not produced uh, it as a commercial insect, this, the parasitoid wasp that I was studying was studied by them. So, it, so that gave us a little bit of a hint that this had some potential. Mm -hmm. So it's really about you know collaborating and going out into the literature and seeing what what is known about this insect before you get started on on a project like this mm -hmm. and yeah and we did have that foundation. Great, thank you. Really fascinating. I never knew there were uh, insects that look like uh, triples uh, from Star Trek. Little, little, <laughs> I know. Little, I mean, little, that's what little, kept little. my attention for all these years. They're they're fascinating, <laughs> and the more you study them, the more you find out about them. and And it's been a real treat to uh, to be able to to publish it and to share their like inner lives with the world. It's amazing. Yeah, I think uh, we take for granted that uh, insects really rule the earth in some respects. There are many more of them than there are of us. It's so true. It's so true. Yeah. Uh, any other questions at this point? Okay. Well, with that, I thank you, Dr. Malki Spodek, for sharing your expertise. A really fascinating uh, presentation. Just uh, certainly uh, news to me. 
Um, and uh, I hope you all enjoyed that. And uh, I hope you'll all register for the Negev Gala. I'll, I can't help plugging that again. Uh, but uh, stay safe and uh, have a great afternoon. And thank you for joining us today. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank Bye. you.